Christians. So the system as a man, whom Paul termed the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, pretending that he is God and having authority over God's people. And then he has a number. Now the magazine, Our Sunday Visitor, which is a Jesuit magazine, it's a publishing house now, it's grown since the time that this was written, and we asked the Jesuits here, what are the letters inscribed on the Pope's crown and what do they signify, if anything? The letters inscribed on the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarius Filii Dei, which is the Latin for the Vicar of the Son of God. Now some claim that this was uh, a mistake, but two years later they published it again with the same explanation. I'm sure the Jesuits would know what is on the pipe, Pope's mitres, even if those mitres are under lock and key today for obvious reasons. So this comes from their mouth and was repeated twice. Vicarius Filii Dei, which is Latin for the Vicar of the Son of God, which literally means in the place of the Son of God, which literally means Antichrist. <laughs> so basically, what's standing on the mitre is Antichrist, Vicarius Filii Dei, and the Latin Letters have numeric value, and if you add them all up, then you will find that they come to 666. But it's not only the number of his name, his title, it's also the number of the beast. So if you use different languages, if you use the Greek, for example, then the official designations for this kingdom are the Latin kingdom, which in the Greek is Helatina Basileia, and that works out to 666 because the Greek letters also have numerical value, and don't confuse an E value 8 with an E value 5 because the one has a little line on it which gives it a different value. And then the Italian church, official title, Italica Ecclesia, and the Latin-speaking man, the title for the papacy in the Greek is Latinos 666. They all work up to 666. So this beast power, the beast itself, the kingdom, has a number, 666, and the name of the man has a number, which is 666. Now it is beyond pure chance that you could have all of these together. So what is the mark of the beast? The only way we can find out what is the mark of the beast is to ask the beast, Excuse me, beast, do you have a mark? <laughs> and the Pope answers, the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. So he says that he stands above the Bible, he can change it. But the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So obviously this is presumption to say that he has power to change the precepts of Christ. So what is his mark? Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change, changing the Sabbath to the Sunday, was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Okay, is there another quote? Yes, Catholic record. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observant is proof of that fact. Obviously, Jesus in Matthew 5, from verse 17 onwards, says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. And then he goes on to say, Not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear from the law until all things have been accomplished. Till heaven and earth disappear, not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law. But here they claim that they've changed the law of God and they make it a mark of their authority. So this must be the mark of the beast. That's why in 2003, as a result of a document which was written when uh, the Sabbath Sunday issue became prominent in the United States in 1888, Rome answered, most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday. 
and that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. So the issue is not the day, the issue is authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday.